Hello and welcome to the Training Science Podcast. I'm Paul Larson. And I am Martin Buscheid. And we're excited to be your hosts. Together, we're going to be exploring both the science of training and its application in sport. We've spent the last 20 years researching and applying the science at the coal face of high-performance sport, from elite clubs, professional athletes, and Olympic programs. But it's going to be here on the Training Science Podcast that we're going to take that experience and provide you with what my colleague Martin likes to call a no-bullshit approach to how we apply the science in the real world. And because the context always matters more than the content. So let's get into today's podcast. Okay, here we are, everyone. Welcome to the Training Science Podcast. My name is Paul Larson. I'm Martin Bouchait. And we're going to be your hosts of this podcast. So I think the very first thing we have to ask ourselves is, what in the heck are we doing, Martin? Um, this is an absolutely saturated market. What the hell are we going forward with launching a bloody podcast in our already busy lives? Yes, and that's probably the first thing I asked you when you put that back on the table and I said, oh, do, are we going to make the time for that? And um, yeah, there's just so many, I think the two of us, we like podcasts, you know, we, we kind of, we enjoy this way of learning because we always manage to do something else on the side as a way to tick many boxes simultaneously. So I think it's a nice format. We like the format. Yeah. Uh, but now, yeah. Are we really thinking we're going to do better than the others? Uh, that's a little bit, maybe too much to start with. Uh, but we believe that we may have a new, maybe a new, a, another way, an original way to, to bring things, to bring our opinions, our new view, our, our views on, on things to hopefully bring something new. No, I don't think. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. So those, those of you that don't know, like our, our, I don't know, our history basically is science and application of training, right? So that's, that's kind of this, we're, we've always been big believers in this middle space. And I think, yeah, just to your point, we want to have this other uh, way of communicating that middle space to, to people. That's what we teach in our hit science course. Um, and that's what we're wanting to, we just want to bring a little bit more of a, of a new format. People can learn on the go, listen to our podcast and whatnot. And, and yeah, that's, uh, and we, and we've, I think we've got a great network as well that we can, that we can, um, that we can pull on. And, and I think that's, that's really, that's the key purpose. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? No, the, uh, oh, def yeah, I definitely agree about this, this middle space. And I think the both of us, you know, have been, we have been in the extreme part of the spectrum being heavy publisher, academic world, having to get those, those stuff into journals where you end up most of the time comprising, comprom compromising a little bit yourself and your ideas because it has to fit into that, but you still want to play the game. You want this journal and so on. So we, yeah. we know the, we know the game as well. You know, we know the research and we like the research for the evidence side of the things and having the things right. But the both of us were also been with top class athletes being in the trenches. And we often realize that the, 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 the gap between both, um, I always talk about the, 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 like the cost benefits or the efforts for the rewards about spending so much time and f or putting so much emphasis in the research and then having to apply things in, in the real world. And you see, for, imagine those, those six months doing biopsies and uh, you know, two max <laughs> tests in the lab and, and I'm working with those guys. I haven't done a test for six months, you know, for example. So I think with our history, our, our background, the two of us, we've probably been, been the most among the most frustrated in both world and seeing that those both world don't always communicate well, you know, yeah. the guys in the lab, they think the coach don't know anything and the coach, they said, they don't research what we want. So I think yeah, that's definitely something we have in common among, among many, many other things. And I hope, I hope that our vision, as, as you said, with the network we have, the, all the people we want to bring in, in this podcast, um, we're hopefully going to bring something uh, a bit different and original to all the great shows that are already uh, on live, of course, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So again, for those of you that are, that are learning about us for the first time, we better start at least with one podcast to go over our, our brief backgrounds. So 
why don't I start? And um, so my, my, my very brief, brief background, I am Canadian born, Vancouver area, um, triathlon was my sport and ultimately failed athlete. So wanted to do that, super passionate about the sport of triathlon in the 80s and 90s and actually spent uh, maybe you know, five years trying to uh, living out of the back of a VW combi van and, uh, and trying to become a professional triathlete. And that failed, so I turned to try to figure it out and, um, and went to sports science, went to UBC, and then got a PhD to a scholarship to the University of Queensland. And that was, that was I, I was so excited about that because that, that's when the Australian Institute of Sport was really kicking goals in the world, as they still are today, but they were, that, was, that was the latest sort of thing. So to go to Australia was was a real honor, and then and I did my my PhD in high intensity interval training, and um, fast forward I guess to 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 I remained down in Australia and I got a got a couple jobs. Uh, I, I sort of went the academic world at that point, right? So started in started in as an athlete, went to science side, um, became an academic at Edith County University. And that's kind of where, that's where I met Martin, actually. We'll, we'll kind of go back to that one. But, um, and then basically 10 years in Australia, um, and then got picked up. And, and I was doing lots of work with the Australian Institute of Sport at that, at that time, Dave Martin, and supervising PhD students who were doing projects with AIS. Got a job with um, the New Zealand Olympic Program. And that basically, um, uh, I was leading the physiology squad there, the physiology team. And then I really got the knack also at the same time working in the sport of triathlon. I, I, I just, uh, I loved working with athletes and I started, uh, I got my, got my wrist slapped a, a few times because I was, I, I took on athletes and, and started coaching them. And cause I really had a, I thought I had a bit of a knack for that. And, um, I still do that today, but eventually, um, had to come back to Canada and, um, this is where I'm, this is where I'm at here today. I'm in the uh, yeah the little town of Revelstoke, and I I coach athletes, uh, professional athletes in the sport of triathlon, um, just uh, online, and and of course of uh, a written hit science with with Martin. So uh, through all the research that we did, so I, I think that's a, a quick version of me. And uh, yeah, I think there's other podcasts and stuff and 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 whatnot if we want to learn more. But yeah, over to you, Martin. Just your your brief uh, similar story to me, I think. <laughs> Similar in terms of failed athletes, failed athlete. for sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my sport was handball, and uh, when I, I came to the strength and conditioning side of the things pretty quickly for myself, because knowing that I didn't have the talent, I probably needed to be or trying to be fitter and, and stronger. So I kind of really yeah, jumped into this this. This, or I always wanted to learn more about the training for myself initially. And I love so much to train myself that then I said, okay, I'm going to train the others. And especially because I was not able to, to, to play at the, at the elite. So I would say that now the, the, the science came after in a sense that I just wanted to understand so much more the training to improve the training processes. And I started to investigate and the, uh, all the research that I came to do that after was really about, about always better understanding my own practices. And that's probably because after having published way too many papers that I also realized that I was still like, again, as I said initially, you, you end up spending too much time for writing those, 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 those papers. And you probably don't always manage to, to close the loop and really, really improve improve training as it was the initial question. So I kind of always changed a little bit the types of jobs. So after being full-time strength conditioning coach throughout the PhD, after my PhD, I uh, started to be lecturer to, to, to be able to keep on uh, teaching and also having, because I mean, when you're, when you're a lecturer, you often have uh, the, the chance to, to, to supervise PhD students. So that was a way to, to push the research forward was not happy with that. So I went to visit you guys. That was 2007 in, uh, in Australia. It was, a, it was just a shock to see how you guys were operating. So I said, I don't want to stay in academia in, in France anymore. Moved to Qatar as a way more sports science applied because I, having, having done already the full-time strength and conditioning 
the lecturing I needed to be now sports science to bring this 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 other like the applied part of the of the science to really put things together. And I think that was a really nice combination to, to go through from those different different jobs. And then kind of the, the concrete a way to put everything together was when I worked in, in Paris Saint Germain for six years after, being head of performance, having some responsibilities on the pitch, leading this kind of department, the sports science. So that was a very nice combination of, of everything. So that was six years up to now a year and a half and COVID and the universe changed completely everything. Started to work remotely for Kitman Lab, a great company. We do analysis, we do science, we do analytics, but for clubs. So we don't, we don't need to publish anything. You know, we're just about digging into their data and understand the question. And that's, that's to me now the best way to research, but on meaningful, meaningful things. But because doing just the research for others was, again, I was starting to miss again something. I, I went back to working now um, in, a, in a football club in France, which is the Lille uh, Olympic Sporting Club, uh, when I'm back into this role of head performance on, on the side of keeping my duties with, with Kitman. And I'm really enjoying the, the balance. And I, was, I would say that now in between this Kitman role and the, Lille at, the role at Lille, I'm really in the middle of, of all the things that I, that I love and I hope to and I keep trying to learn from one side to, to, to feed the other. And it's really going on, on both sides. Mm -hmm. And again, talking about this training, science, the application, this is where really where, where we are at the, at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's, a, that's awesome. So all, I think uh, it's pretty, pretty evident from both of our intros there that we've just, yeah, we've, we've, we've kind of gone back and forth between the, the research side of things, I think, uh, you know, probably 300 publications between us and then lots of time at the coal face as well with athletes and coaches and uh, you know, starting to appreciate context as well. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about here today. And uh, on that, you know, I think even for the way we presented ourselves, uh, like, you know, Paul, you start with talking about your PhDs and everything, but even as an athlete, you know, like the, how many triathlon have you, have you, have you done? About a hundred or more. You know, so I think that that's, you know, you talk about the, the 300 publications, but what about hundred triathlon, yeah. you know, yeah. this, this is another, uh, because you, it's not only the, the, the time, the hours you put in yourself, but just the learnings that you got from training yourself, mm -hmm. the number of athletes you coach, that's, some, that's not written anywhere. Again, because I can, people from the outside, people who don't know us or people like, like us, I would say, you see what is, what you can read somewhere in a curriculum. So you see the publication, but you don't see those training hours, the time with athletes, all those things. And I would define myself probably by many, many, many other things that's those uh, two or 300 publications. Mm -hmm. You know, most of my time, my thinking, my interest is not about the research, even though people, most of people know me because of the research. You know, that's a bit the tip of the iceberg. But I don't define us, ourselves in terms of the, the energy we put in things and our interest as typical researchers. Because the typical researchers, their life is their publications. And for us, it's far from being it. And this is why I think with a lot of humility, of course, that we have a, at least an, a, a unique type of approach of the things because of the things outside of the research that we love and put our energy into it. Uh, yeah, well said, well said. I don't think there's, yeah, there's much more to say on that. And yeah, it's, uh, I, and again, mate, um, you're, you're the same, so. Yeah, honored to, to hold hands and walk down this road. And I think, and hopefully, and I think we already are, but there's, there's so many others that are out there, people that are um, our colleagues and that are part of Hit Science and, and many others that uh, they walk this walk as well, which is really, really cool. Uh, so, you know, we could go on a lot longer on that one, but we should probably move to, to a little bit of um, context, uh, I guess. And, um, yeah, we should, or philosophy. That's what I want to move to next, if we can. So, you know, we're we, we get this, and we're we're going to start in with these next uh, three episodes. So one, two, three is is really going to be where we're going to give ultimately a Coles Notes version of the foundation of of hit science, and based on this history, this is where we kind of 
came to in, in 2018 when we finally put everything down into a book and a course. And yeah, I think, you know, I think you, you, you were always the best at teaching me this, Martin, um, as with so many things is that the, the very, the very key philosophy in very, in, in only a few short words is, uh, as you've taught me is context drives the content. So what does that mean to you, Martin? I think yeah, this is really what makes the, 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 the complexity, but also the interest of our jobs when we work in, in elite performance with, with athletes, is that most of the time, and this, this, this is exact sentence comes, comes from you, of course, about the, there's always many, many ways to, to skin a cat, you know, um, there is always the thing that looks right, that looks ideal, but then there is always the, the other part of making this happen. And this is always, again, context driven. So you come with the research, with your studies, what you've learned, and then you say, okay, let's probably the best thing to do tomorrow in this session is to do, to run this. And if we want to talk about high intensity, we, we can use, because that's of, of course the, the, the core of what we've done together, but you can apply that to any type of session. You can add, add, apply that to nutrition, to when you have a nap or everything, you always have what is supposed to be the best option. And then it's almost all the time a compromise or an adaptation. And when you realize that, and when you talk to people that don't have this science approach of the things, they only have the context. And so when you start, this is where things start to, to crash because there's some people that just on, always on the, on the, on the adaptation side of the things. And you come with things that for them look very too, too rigid because ah, research has said you should do 10 reps of this exercise to reduce injury, for example, you know, which is super naive. And those guys will say, yeah, but we've, we are not always doing this exercise, but we are doing three other exercises that touch the same muscle. So are we doing what the research says, or we're doing something which is better or wrong? And you said, yeah, by the way, you're probably clever than me because by doing other exercises, you're still following the same objective, but you're just talk, touching more fibers. So in the end, it's probably way better what you guys do, for example. But it's not about context, but it's about, about the fact that research is too narrow most of the time. So the context, again, drives almost all the time to me the 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 the, 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 the optimal response. And if we have all the content integrated in our hard drive, then we can apply the right context, the right content once we have understood the context. Mm -hmm. And this is why one of the most, if you ask people that are, have been in, in, in elite sport for, for, for a while, or the successful people versus the less successful, the first thing that will always come to in, in, in mind from everyone will be the capacity to adapt the program, the knowledge, to the athletes, to the moment, things that work one year, you do the same the year after, does not work, and vice versa. Uh, there's people that even talk about the, the art of coaching, which I, of course I can't, you know, with this scientific background, you cannot go completely vote for the, everything is an art, but it's always a balance of, of everything, of course, you know. And I think what we love is to, once you have understood the context, then bring the science and the evidence back in. So that's, you don't just don't do things based on your guts and, and your feelings. And that's also about, you know, like I'm going a little bit further than that, but the evidence based versus the evidence informed type of practices, you know, you're informed about the evidence, but then let me apply it in my context because the science doesn't know the context, those papers, those things, they, 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 they don't, they don't know if you had a nap or not, if you came at, at 3 a.m. or you had a, you had a great night's sleep. How, who, who knows that? Who knows then the best running technique, the best exercise is this one or that one. You completely have to adapt because of many things that arise that you cannot phantom without being there. Mm -hmm. That's also why I'm often skeptical with planning too much in advance or having these kind of things because you have to adapt all the time. You spend your time adapting and then choosing the least bad option rather than the best or the optimal. Mm -hmm. So I think you've given in this, um, obviously I'm fully on board with it. I think you've really given the, the forte of the, um, the argument for what's important, maybe to the, the person that's embedded in, in the, 
in the sport um, because they appreciate the context first and foremost. And and maybe that's maybe that's right. But on the um, on the flip side, where does the I don't know less um, science informed what you know really appreciating context practitioner coach or whatever fall down if they don't pay attention a little bit to the um, to the to the science. They might just rely, yeah. In this case, they rely more on their on on their guts and their feeling, and they might just repeat things that they've always done without having enough open mindedness to understand that what they do might not be optimal, or they might have new practices or other things that could also work. So that's probably the the the, the downside of just considering the context, and I'm used to that. So that's. Mm. That's probably. Do you have any yeah. good examples that um, that people would might might uh, relate to that you've that you've come across? Typically, you you've been coaching in a in your own club or environment in your sport, and you always done the thing this way. So that's 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 the way, and it works. It's your training philosophy. Mm -hmm. So you always like to do these kind of exercises because you know their work, and athletes they, they love them. And uh, the next year, you just move to another club or you work with another athlete that for different reason has a different nationality, he's been through something, something completely different. And the coach that doesn't have this ability to, to really eat, the, 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 or he's, he's too much centered on, on his beliefs and doesn't manage to open to the science and other things, uh, in this case, no, because in this case, it's about overlooking the context, what I'm, what I'm trying to say. But that's a, it's a very good example. So it's not exactly what you were asking. But in this case, you change, you change environment, you change, you change athletes, but you don't consider enough the new context and you keep doing the things that you were doing before. And you're going to crash for sure. Yeah. You're going to crash because those athletes are not used to, to have this, this, this workload that they're not used to do this type of prevention work on a given day before, bef before, uh, um, the day before a match versus, and just because they are not used to that and because you have not considered enough the context, even though it might, it might look, might look right on the paper. It might have worked in your previous context. Mm -hmm. It might not work again. So if you don't have this capacity to really step back, observe and say, okay, context is different. All right. So if we can't, if I can't fit my usual, training routine that day because those guys have never done it fair enough but then when can i still fit this routine because i still believe this routine is important but i might put it on another day of the week mm -hmm. so that you still tick the stick the box mm -hmm. but at least you have that it yeah yeah no i think uh yeah <laughs> it's interesting i asked you to, uh, to go the other way but you, you kind of brought it back to the context but you're right at the end of the day that is that is the key. You still have to have both. If you're not appreciating the science of, uh, end of it, um, then, or, you know, the, the basic foundation and fundamentals of the science, you can't go back in and adapt under a new context. Um, so I think the other uh, example that you've often given to me is that we have certain certain tools that we often use. It's maybe this is the same example, but it's like I always use VO2 max intervals on uh, Tuesday or whatever, you know what I mean? Like it's just, this is, and this is my, this is the, the string that I've got in my bow and I apply that and that's just the way things work. Cause that's, uh, yeah. Cause I know that. And yeah, we need to, we need to go a little bit deeper. And if you understand the, the different, um, how the different levers can be pulled within the training science, then it gives you this whole new power ultimately to go into any other co new context and um, you know, Deacon, Deacon, move in that to um, to go and hit the nail um, of of training stimulus or response that you want to um, to put your athlete in the best um, the best position that they that they need to be in every, any given important important time. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to find a, a, a proper example of again being too too strict on just repeating things. So again, uh, I'm talking about team sports, of course, because that's, that's really my, my, my thing. Uh, let's say you have 
identify the player who would need uh, some fitness top-ups because ba based on your testing, on your monitoring, this guy has been identified that he, he needs he needs some some metabolic conditioning. So if you always been into the, the the typical okay typical conditioning is about running. So this guy is going to train with the team and we're going to have him do a few extra session after after some of the key session in the week so that he gets more work done because that's what he needs. So that's the funnel view. He needs to improve, so let's work more. But what you don't see with having just him running more after each training session is that you're going to increase his running load through, through the extras. So having the ability to, to think more about your, the, the actual content and what are the other alternative options to still work on his fitness without obligatory in increasing his running load, then you might think, okay, why not use intervals on a bike? Why not using heat exposure and these kind of things? And then you, t you start to eventually reach the same objective, which is in increasing the volume of metabolic conditioning, but without, in this case, increasing his running load, which hopefully, likely, uh, will probably be better tolerated, mm -hmm. you know? I think that, that's typically the, the example where the context will help to drive what is the best addition in, in this exact uh, case, a specific case for, for this athlete, for example. So you've just, you've just highlighted a couple of, uh, of key things that we're going to talk about in the next episode, and that is the different physiological targets. So, um, for example, you've just you've mentioned the running load, and the running load is going to have a certain neuromuscular uh, physiological response. And the bike is going to have a different one, right? The bike is going to be a little bit more, uh, you know, cardio-based, uh, so aerobic response. So this is kind of how we can move the different, the different lead levers to still get that, um, yeah, the the optimal physiological status ultimately on um, or training status on on game day, and that's what we're after. So maybe that's actually where we should. Um, just make, let's finish up here with context uh, because we're, we're what we're working on. I'm gonna we're gonna place for those that are that are in the video content or that are watching the video. We will we'll put this up and we'll we'll, we'll, um, we'll give a little bit of a picture. This is our key figure. Those of, those of you that have been with us for a while, but we'll just fi finish on the left hand side of the figure and and we've got um, the key con contextual uh, considerations that we want to have a grasp on that we've outlined at least in the book. Science and application of high intensity interval training on in the course. So we've got our sport demands. We've got our um, so obviously you know uh, endurance sports are going to have going to be different in terms of their demands relative to the, uh, the the many of the team sports and even even within endurance sports there's various different uh, you know divisions or or, uh, or code or, um, not codes but. Uh, you know, distances, say, for example, that are going to have different demands, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's so many contexts with, within that. Uh, we've got the athlete profile, the individual. So we're, go we're doing more and more work on this these days to look at the different, um, you know, how, how we're, we're all made up so much different with the different uh, fiber types and, um, you know, anaerobic speed, uh, speed reserves, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the, we always have to look to the individual. Um, we have to look on any given game day when we're applying something, the, the adaptations that we're after from that response, we have to think long-term. Can't just think, you know, in that, in that given moment. And, you know, this brings it back to the, to the periodization as well. Um, what, what sort of phase are we in? So um, now those are the key ones that are outlined on this figure. Are there any others, Martin? That I mean, there's so many contextual ones. But are there any big, big, big ones that you think you know we if we're going to rewrite this uh, this figure again that you might put in there? I think you have also all the the daily the the, the daily the events that happen uh, in the athlete's life. Mm -hmm. Again, you put a lot of sleep. Uh, again, talking about the, the congested fixtures in, in, in training. Uh, ideally, um, the day after a match, the substitute will have to do a hard session to compensate for the match they did not play. That's the plan. That's the, the, the ideal content. Context, uh, the plane was delayed. You came back, it's 4 a.m. 
you might not do those hard intervals. Or if you want to them to do this hard type of work, then you're going to work on the format of this work so that you might decrease the neuromuscular load, so you may diminish the risk of injury in the context of acute fatigue. Mm -hmm. You know? So I think, and talking about this example I just gave now, uh, we should almost probably start with this earlier in the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about okay. the, the edits, because that's right to the point. And, um, or maybe it's, a, it's, I think the whole part we did about the context, it's, it's, it's a lot of time for not, nothing really bang, you know, mm -hmm. I'll be happy almost to redo. Yeah. And that, portion of that, because yeah. that's very important. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I just can't, you know, I was working with an athlete yesterday, actually, and um, I was just going to psychological state. I've, we've had that in there before, but psychological state and, um, you know, uh, accumulated fatigue. And these are, these are, you know, reasons you would change the context or you would change, change up the session immediately exactly. based on, based on what that, what you're sort of seeing in front of you. So, so why don't we restart again, but we use the, we gave, we give those examples straight. Yeah. Yeah, we will. Well, this is, and but this is what the, the training science podcast is really all about. Uh, if, if you ask me, it's, it's people who will want to come in and listen to this podcast because they can hear us live, um, ultimately rewriting the book and course, um, as we go for it, as, as we build a sort of version two of this. Yep. Yeah. So it's almost about going deeper into all the contextual factors that people consider to make decisions. Yeah, as absolutely. As that. Absolutely. But, um, you know, that's, that, that is, that's definitely what the majority of the, of the podcast is going to be about, but we still have to finish up and we have to, we, you know, we want to just have in these in podcast one, two, three, we're really just going to put it, lay some foundation. So in the next podcast, um, what I'd like us to focus on are, are really just the physiological targets, the key physiological targets that, that we go after, um, typically when we, cause you know, eventually we are going to get to the, the content. You gotta, we gotta put something down in the plan and we gotta, we, we gotta do something to prepare. So what are those? And, um, and let's, let's give some good examples and let's be really clear on what those are. So, um, without, uh, I think that's probably good, good little wrap up for, for episode one, Martin. Thanks so much for coming in with, uh, and, and, and going on this journey with me and, um, Let's go forward. Sure. Let's, 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 let's see how it goes. Let's see how, <laughs> where this goes. Okay. Thanks team.